Melbourne Tower, this is Charlie Abelobo, taxi in seconds. Charlie Abelobo, Melbourne Tower, runway 17, wind 180 degrees 12 knots, QNH 1021 millibars, time 16. At this airport, somewhere in Australia, all is peaceful, but there is something in the air. Oh dear, oh dear, what will everyone say? This will be great fun for the children, he said. But as soon as they get the hang of it, I'll leave them to it. I'm not interested in aeroplanes. There has to be an easier way. What's this radio control business? given dad this book on radio control. He was fascinated. In fact, he couldn't put it down. He became so optimistic, he thought that radio control was going to solve all his problems. <laughs> Little did he know. All this seemed rather confusing at the time. I was only six. But I can remember the night he arrived home with an interesting looking box. Close to my birthday too.
and I were disappointed to find that it was just a lot of wood. Building a model should be a piece of cake. I mean, I've just built a broom cupboard, haven't I? Just the same, I hope Frank calls in. Ah. I had taken along the remains of my invader to show Morrie. I thought it might have given him <laughs> a few clues. As I checked one of my gliders some 25 years later, I could look back with astonishment to those days when so often planes were to become remains. The invader I took to Murray's had been reduced to a mess of soggy balsa through laying in the bush for three months until discovered by linesmen. But one memento of that old model is still intact. However, why should I trouble Murray with problems that may never arise? Hmm? <laughs> Anyhow, let's get the model built. I wonder whether it will split when I squeeze the back ends together. The die cut ribs certainly pop out easily. Who was it said the ribs are to keep the front and back of the wings apart? The escapement is the vital mechanical link in the system which will operate the rudder in the completed model. like an aeroplane. I think I'll make a noise like one. We found our covering material in the dress department of Ball and Welsh in Flinders Street, which has long since closed its doors. Known as glass nylon, it was very strong, but the open weave required a lot of filling with aeroplane dope.
At last the eagerly awaited receiver kit had arrived from England. It was typical of those in use, in that only the rudder could be operated, and only one model could be in the air at a time. Ideas flew around the night the Brains Trust assembled to decide on which transmitter to build. Doug was a great help. He had bound copies of Aero Modeler magazine going back into the 1930s. we can expect a woman to put her finger on an important point. Who's a simpleton? After that happy and entertaining evening, the transmitter was built to the Aeromodeler design, and like the original, in an OXO tin kindly provided by the local grocer. There might be some rubbish lying about, and what is that against the beauty of one's first model? Now to see whether the radio system works. First, the rubber must be wound for this provides motive power for the escapement. And this in turn operates the rudder. Press the button on the transmitter and everything should function. There's going to be a lot of double blipping though. And now all that was required was a little patience till a suitable day dawned.
A lot of water has flowed under the bridge since those days. Or I should have said that a lot of air has flowed over the wing. There have been many changes. Not the least of these changes have been in the street itself. <laughs> and of course, there have been additions to the family. <laughs> Matthew, Grandma might be in the garden. Uh, what yeah. have you got? A tonka truck. This is a tonka truck. A tonka truck. Yes. Good heavens. Look, me have a look. Yes. Where? I'll show Grandma what it does. Oh, what a big thing. Isn't that lovely? Now you put one of your men there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, mate. How are you? How are you? That reminds me. Where have our two heroes gotten to since they disappeared in a cloud of dust? Well, they are hell bent on reaching the scene of their first catastrophe. ready to go, but he seems reluctant to undertake the first important step, the glide test. This will prove whether the model will glide smoothly rather than tumbling out of the sky when the motor stops. and only a minor adjustment was necessary to the tail plane. It was vital before the first flight, but sometimes necessary even before every flight, that the receiver was adjusted or tuned till it was accepting the maximum signal from the transmitter. they got to laugh about at a time like this. As I tried to start the old ED racer motor on that summer's day in 1963, the last thing on my mind was how this area would alter during the next 25 years, or for that matter, how much would I? I would find that the sunburnt paddocks with their few street signs were now covered with hundreds of homes and were barely recognisable as a temporary flying field we had known. Hmm, this might be the hill I ran down when we did the glide test.
150 years ago, this land formed part of Kangaroo Park Outstation. Later, it was renamed Moorlbark Park and over the years has been home to a number of well-known pastoral families. The old homestead, now much altered, has become headquarters of the country club. But now the time has come to look back to my first ever flight, back then. For six months we had waited with barely concealed impatience. Were we to be rewarded with a smooth, skillfully controlled first flight? What happened? I forgot to double blip! <sighs> It was said that a Bakelite motor plate would break first, so protecting the engine. Well, many motor plates later... As January and February gave way to March, the excitement continued unabated. And yet, many of our problems were caused by the escapement sticking at one position and could not be blamed entirely on any loose nut on the transmitter. information provided in the Glenn Curtis Flying Handbook of 1911 is just as relevant today. To return to terra firma, the apparatus will assume what is known as a gliding position, except in the case of those machines which are inherently unstable. These will assume the position known as involuntary spin and will return to Earth without further action on the part of the aeronaut. By now, I should have become downhearted if I hadn't noticed that the others were having problems too. Those magnificent men in their flying machines, they go up till the up, up, they go down to the up, down. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, repairs were completed and it was only necessary to check the balance. Again, we hear from the handbook of 1911. When sufficient speed has been attained, the device will assume the position of aeronautical ascent. <laughs> With all our problems solved, we relax as the invader climbed away. Some of the most enjoyable moments would come as the model glided back for a landing after the motor had cut. Here, 
unknown to us at the time, was a pointer to the future. We flew a number of other models in those days. I remember the Viking, a low wing Swedish kit, about four foot wingspan, had a side mounted diesel in the nose. Flew beautifully for a single channel. What about the Irk? We all built one. I called mine Merck, you know, M for Merv. It was a little beauty. Built from a plan in the English magazine model aircraft. It had a 40-inch wingspan and I fitted a 1cc diesel. Great to fly. The fuel tank was a bit small though. Now there was a model, the Jetco Imperial. A motorised glider had a one and a half OS motor in the nose with an eight foot under cambered wing. Had hundreds of ribs and stringers, <laughs> so it seemed. God, it was a counter build. It was rudder only, so your trim had to be right. But unfortunately, we were oriented towards standard power models, so the full potential of this beautiful machine was never realised. And now for a final instruction on landing procedures from Glenn Curtis. The aeronaut should move his control pole gently toward himself, thus causing the mechanism to alight more or less gently on the ground. It was a pleasure to return once again to the scenes of our earliest flights. But as someone said, one should never become complacent. I reckon it'll be all right, you know. Here's another bit. If you just cut down there, separate it out, put a bit of, squeeze a bit of glue in when no, you look, separate Frank, it out. Th this put is a, few a finish. Clamps on it. And this is, this is a finish. That, I'm yeah. giving it all away. Mm. I know what I'm going to take up. Hey, Paul. Isn't it good to see Daddy happy again? Yeah. By gee, this is really living. <laughs> Stop! Don't put on the light. That wasn't the end at all. No, that really was the beginning, because you see, 
we had discovered a whole new world. 